Welcome to the episode on Disruptive Innovation Revisited, where I look at an article written by Clayton Christensen, the person who in 1995 kind of birthed the idea of disruptive innovation. I want to especially welcome back uh, listeners from 72 countries to the Innovation Best Practices, designed to help you sell more and make more regardless of the type of business and innovation need that you have. So welcome back. Um, there's several ways you can engage innovation best practices with video casts on YouTube. Just go to YouTube in the search bar, put Richard Innovation Best Practices. You'll get some search results. We'll be fourth or fifth or whatever down on the list. Click on it and you'll be on the page where all of the current video casts are available. You can also listen to this as a podcast by going to i2ge, that's i, the number two, ge.com slash podcast or to iTunes in the podcast section, search for innovation best practices and you will find us. And if you're there, please consider giving us on iTunes a five-star rating and review. It really helps more people discover um, the innovation best practices. Free blog at i2ge.com slash blog and free apps. Uh, all you need to do is search for Innovation Best Practices in the App Store or Google Play for the iPhone, iPad, and Android, respectively. Another free that we have is the twice-a-month newsletter with insights that are available, not available, rather, in any of the podcast or video cast. And you get that very easily by texting to the number 33444-33444, the one word, free 33, no spaces, free 33. And if you want to contact me, just send me an email. I love hearing from you at richard at i2ge.com. Well, Christensen has felt a need to update from 1995 Disruptive Innovation Understandings. This is going to be a little interesting episode because um, I'm not totally aligned with, I'm, I understand where he's coming from and he's accurately stating it, but um, I think the world may have moved on. A few quotes in here because I really want to make sure I accurately represent his points of view. This is Clayton Christensen, Harvard Business School, Harvard Business Review article. Quote, unfortunately, disruption theory is in danger of becoming a victim of its own success. <laughs> Nicely said. Despite broad dissemination, the theory's core concepts have been widely misunderstood and its basic tenets frequently misapplied. And that's why he's writing the article. Many researchers, writers, and consultants use disruptive innovation to describe any situation in which an industry is shaken up and previously successful incumbents stumble. But that's too broad a usage. I'm not sure I totally agree. Okay. He goes on to say, disruption describes a process whereby a smaller company with fewer resources is able to successfully challenge established incumbent businesses, specifically as incumbents focus on improving their products and services for the most demanding and usually the most profitable customers, they exceed the needs of some segments and ignore the needs of others, close quote, which creates an opportunity. More quotes. Entrants that prove disruptive begin by successfully targeting those overlooked segments, gaining a foothold by delivering more suitable functionality, frequently at a lower price. Incumbents chasing higher profitability and more demanding segments tend to respond vigorously. Entrants then move up market, delivering the performance that incumbents mainstream customers require, while preserving the advantages that drove their early success. When mainstream customers start adopting the entrance off offerings in volume, disruption has occurred, close quote. Very interesting here. He's saying that a new company comes in at the low end while the, company's fo the current incumbent company is focusing on the top end and finds a niche at the bottom, establishes it, and then eventually grows into the, the uh, more profitable businesses. Very interesting definition of disruptive innovation really applying to those conditions. Uh, in the article, they say, is Uber disruptive based on those criteria? And according to Christensen's definition, the answer is no. Ask cab drivers in any city whether they feel disrupted. Uh, to be disruptive, innovations originate at the low end or are new market footholds. Neither of these is Uber. 
Uber's not at the low end. They're at the at similar pricing, sometimes lower, sometimes higher, d- depending on surge pricing, um, than the existing cab companies. The first appeal of disruptive innovations are not with mainstream customers, and that's exactly where Uber's appeal is. So Christensen says on these two counts, Uber is not disruptive. Not too sure outside of academia people would agree with that. Here's how Christensen sees disruptive innovation. It's a process where a company starts at the fringe and moves to the mainstream. For example, Netflix. Uh, Netflix started Blockbuster. Yes, there was a company called Blockbuster around a very successful company. Netflix started on the fringes and gradually became the giant, and Blockbuster today is out of business. Disruption often comes from innovative business models very different from incumbents. For example, Apple with its iPhones and everything, and and iPod initially with apps and access to the Internet was a very, very different business model and channel uh, innovation strategy. He goes on to say, incumbent companies do need to respond to disruption if it is occurring, but they should not overreact by dismantling a still profitable business. Instead, they should continue to strengthen relationships with core customers by investing in sustaining innovations, make the current product stronger and stronger, keep them viable, keep them competitive. In addition, they can create a new division that focuses solely on the growth opportunities that arise from the disruption. So pay attention to your existing business and create a separate division to deal and fend off and compete with the entrant or the disruptive force. Um, A couple of insights here. Incumbent companies make decisions based upon the interest of their customers who provide them with the financial resources to survive. No, No surprise there. The innovation program is designed to serve those existing customer interests. The focus on existing customers makes it very difficult for the company to shift any investment to disruptive innovations. And they go on, Christians and go on and say, those two insights helped explain why incumbents rarely respond effectively, if at all, to disruptive innovations. That's also very true. Okay, defending against disruptive innovation, he says, our current belief is that companies should create a separate division that operates under the protection of senior leadership to explore and exploit a new disruptive model. Very tellingly, he concludes, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, but it is the best chance for success. Well, disruptive innovation, why is it becoming more successful? He says, the question now is whether there is a novel technology or business model that allows new entrants to move up market without emulating the incumbent's high cost, that is, to follow a disruptive path. The answer seems to be yes, and the enabling innovation is online learning, which is becoming broadly available. And when you talk about online learning for innovation, these video cast and podcast fall exactly into that category where we're sharing um, innovation best practices broadly and for free, giving a lot more people access. The vast majority of usages uh, of disruptive innovation do not follow Christian's specific and limiting definition. And Christian's in right to note that people are using it in a way that he did not intend. But my opinion is that the phrase disruptive innovation is appropriate when an innovation changes the rules of a game of a business by delivering new benefits, utilizing a new business model, and or effectively brings one of the other 10 types of innovation to the category or type of product. You'll recall an earlier podcast, a series of podcasts on the 10 types of innovation. Okay, a few more concluding thoughts. A podcast, videocast, blog, like this one, Innovation Best Practices, is a significant source of online learning, giving far, far more people access to it. As you may recall, when I, in the early episodes of this, I explained the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm doing this is 
that um, very large companies have been paying me six to seven figures to gain access to the tools and best practices that I'm sharing here. And you now gain access to them for free. That's a major change in the marketplace in terms of information about innovation best practices. And by making broad and free access to innovation best practices, more existing companies, and more importantly, more entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs can increase their chances for success. Good luck. If you want to learn more about innovation best practices, just go to the i2ge.com website. On the menu bar on the left, just click on DIY Innovation Training. You'll see a lot of training programs there. If you don't see one that fits your needs, just send me an email and we can tailor one for you. Here's what these are all about. This is my intent here is to help make you innovation self-sufficient. So you do not need to hire costly consultants like me to do it for you. This is a major cost savings for many, if not most, companies. Another resource is one of my six books that I've written. It's Proven Practical Innovation That Delivers Results. It's available only at Amazon in paperback and Kindle. It's value priced at below my break-even cost. So great value. If you have suggestions, comments, or requests, as always, I love hearing from you. Just send me an email to richard at i2ge.com. In the next episode, I take a very interesting look at some recent major innovations. Um, as I'm uh, doing this episode, it's getting towards the end of 2015, and a lot of magazines and everything are publishing some of the best innovations of the year, and I've done a review of those and I want to share some of those with you and give you my thoughts on their chances for success using the kinds of criteria that have been available to you in previous episodes. So make sure you tune in. As you know, I'm always deeply, deeply appreciative of you taking time out of your busy life to be with me. And I really look forward to connecting with you soon. And until then, please, please have a great day. 